Ah, uh, here he is. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Maybe. Maybe. Good morning, Jamie. Okay. Yeah, I played that video for you guys and came back and everybody was frozen. Yeah. We didn't see nothing showed up on the screen. It was blank. You were frozen and we didn't see the movie. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, let's go back and try it again then. Okay. And, uh, okay. Seems to be the way my day is going. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so uh, hang on. We weren't ready to do that. <coughs> All right. Where'd you go? There you go. All right. There you guys are. All right. Let me get this set up, and we'll get rock and rolling. How you doing, Gene? I'm so far so good. I got to go in very shortly to a physical therapy appointment, but I'm 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 in watching as long as I can. Okay, dear. All right. Well, we'll get rocking and rolling, and I will start with the first video again. I'm sorry about all of that, everybody. Uh, let's share that. Okay, and that's the one that we want. Okay, everybody see a black screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Good black screen, right. Yes. Uh, okay. All right. Now we have pictures. Yes. <clears throat> wow. <clears throat> It's it's buffering or something through it. I don't know, but I'm not going to mess with this this time because I think last time I lost you guys. <coughs> Goodness gracious, a lot. Oh. 
Okay. So now I'll ask, what'd you guys think? Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Too bad we didn't see uh, much of the artwork. Pardon? And we really didn't see much of her art. Well, no, there were 650 pieces of it total. Yeah. It, it, um, it, but, the fact, but the fact that uh, they were able to... Stop that, please. Um, and it survived it all is amazing. Right. Yeah. And, and particularly, I don't, I don't know what they were doing in the process of demolishing that house, but, you know, that art being inside the walls and them starting the demolition process, it's amazing that, uh, you know, any of the workers took note of that and actually stopped and let anybody know, <laughs> you know. So that's, that's pretty amazing, but uh, quite an interesting story. And uh, sometimes, you know, things work out. Really good for, for being inside walls mm -hmm. and, and, and all it has been through, but the colors were st still look, from what I saw, pretty, pretty clear and fresh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, you know, I mean, she may have had them rolled or in some kind of container or something um but uh but yeah the for the paintings being the age that they are and unframed yeah they held up you know really pretty well were they watercolor well a couple of them were a couple of more watercolor and it looked like she did prints as well you know those stacks of paper um those looked like they, those were probably like litho prints or something like that done on the litho stone and uh, so yeah pretty amazing that any of it really made it exactly. you know that far but it's it's nice that we have it again and well or that the family has it and we'll see what they do um i don't know if anybody noticed but uh the family had already been approached by several different museums mm -hmm. right wanted wanted to buy the collection they said it may have an international uh show maybe it might <clears throat> yeah and i think if i were the family um one of the contingent deals if if they were going to you know <clears throat> let a museum take it would be that you know they they put some kind of traveling show together so that people could see it you know because yeah. i mean if if you go back and try to research her, there's very very little information on her. So, um, you know, it was pretty much sort of just written off that most of her work was either destroyed or whatever, and uh, not around anymore. So, anyway, moving on. Uh, the next guy, I think he's <coughs> this guy is from Turkey. You know, Istanbul. Let's see. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So let's just back that up. Thank you. 
Okay. Any thoughts about any of that? I, I love, I love the way like that looks. Marbles. I'm sorry, what? I said the way he does his eyes, they look like marbles. That bothers me. Uh huh. Yeah, they they're they're a little bit creepy looking, aren't yeah. they? Yeah, they are. And and the white, the the white, they look ghostly. I mean, it's not um, it's not a pleasing, a comfortable feeling to. To be with that art, to me, mm -hmm. I agree. Okay, but I uh, but I love the movement in his paintings. I mean, he really was able to capture the yes. the moving objects, characters, people within the. Yeah, I think I think a lot of the group scenes with the musicians and dancers and folks like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I like those in particular. Uh, and they had kind of a moody, atmospheric feel to them. Yes. Um, the the kind of portraits. Yeah, <laughs> found those a little bit disturbing, you know. Um, and then some, at the very beginning, you know, they showed a couple of nudes that I thought, you know, were interesting. You know, really, it's a it was a nice technique in turning form and the uh, and, and flesh tones, you know, painting flesh tones and things. Um, and, you know, I thought he did really well with that. It really reminded me of a, a French post-impressionist artist that I'm trying to, uh, like a Voltan. Um, it was kind of reminiscent of, you know, of, of that approach to uh, painting the figure, so. But uh, yeah, interesting stuff. Now this is a, uh, well, he was born in 1958, okay? And he's Russian, I believe. You know, could be Russian, could be, you know, any of those Baltic countries. So let's uh, see what he does. Thank you. 
Thank you. 
Okay. Any thoughts about any of that stuff? Oh, I thought it was great. You liked it. Okay. I loved it. I right. liked it. It was Can I, I ask? think it's very interesting to see these artists that we didn't know about. Okay. Can I can I ask what is it that you liked about the work? I liked it that it was free. It was loose. Okay. It was. Uh, anybody else? Yes, I, I, I liked some of the backgrounds because they were pretty abstract, but it made it so interesting instead of the same polished. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and plus the fact, I thought he painted in, in blobs and then took your technique you're trying to show everybody about the linear outline of the body, not to outline the whole thing, but just in spots, how mm -hmm. he picked up so you could get the entire movement of the body. I thought right. that was pretty interesting how he just took a blob for the top or a blob for the dress and then just made it flow with just a, 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 a few linear lines on the outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with Gene. That's, that's what I noticed too, the lines that we were talking about yesterday, the mm -hmm. just whole lines. And also I thought his landscapes had a great depth to them as well. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's good at managing color, um, but he's also good at um, what we would call gestural painting. Right. Uh, and he, he does that even with his landscapes. It, uh, yes. it doesn't feel labored or like really overworked. It's very direct, very spontaneous. And with his figures, uh, yeah, very much so. You know, it's it's very much so he he you know paints them in sort of a gestural yes. uh, approach. I like that. I thought it was interesting. Yeah, really. I yeah, noticed those lines also. Um, but I was wondering. I thought you had said that the wider lines, uh, broader lines on the shadow side, and I I didn't. It looked like his were kind of scattered. I don't know, but the paintings were nice. It looked like he did do a lot of gestural drawings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for the most part, and we can go back and look if we want, but um, yeah, the the sides that sort of attached to the the darker values tended to be a little heavier and broader. And then he would almost, in, in some places, like on the lighter side, he would just lose the line totally. It would just not be there. Um, but yeah, for the most part, yeah, I think he, he paid a fair amount of attention, you know, to how he placed those lines um, and the width of them. And even sort of the, it was a brush stroke, you know? So in some places it looked like he really pressed in with the brush and then made a very quick movement with it, you know? Cause it went from this very thick, you know, dark or, you know, very bold spot out to like a line that just kind of, you know, disappeared. So there was a lot of variety in that stroke. You know, it wasn't, you know, like the same width all the way along the edge. And uh, yeah, it gave it sort of this lyrical sort of movement, you know, to the, to the paint, which uh, I thought was really landscapes you know, look a little like a childlike, uh, uh, you know, feel to it. It was mm -hmm. so loose. Yeah. But, but the colors uh, and, and the way it went from the foreground to the background was uh, really loose. It was interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here, let's. Um, I'll tell you what. Let's let's do this. Let's go back. Let's look at a couple of them. Uh, you know, more closely. Uh, What's for... his name? What's his name? Karolenkov? <laughs> Is uh, that his name? Yeah, right. Uh, Karol... Karolenkov? Karolenkov. Yeah. yeah. Slava, okay. S L A V A. Okay. And then K O R. Lenkov. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. He was born in 1958, so he's. 
a baby. Two years younger than me. Um, but you know, okay, so here's here's one of his figures. And you know, there's an outline, you know, but it's in a very cool color and it's very much so in keeping with the uh, palette of the, the painting itself. Let's go back and see if we can find some other examples. Uh, those aren't the ones that I was really thinking about. Those were a little more- I have a pretty. question. Yeah. But go back to the one with her stockings. What What is the purpose of showing her with the stockings? I, I don't see it. What do you think of that? <laughs> That's supposed to be sexy? Um, maybe, but you know, maybe it's also a way of isolating the light, you know, on the figure to the upper part of the body up around her hair and, and, you know, keeping your focus up here, okay? Cause this kind of falls into, you know, the background, right? It doesn't seem to be as, as important as this area up here, where if you would have kept that whole leg light, you know, then our focus might have been, you know, more in this area. But this, this is one of the ones, Eloise, that we're, I was talking about. See here on the bottom, you know, he's got some heavier strokes, you know, kind of indicating weight and compression. Mm -hmm. And then on the upper part, he's got an outline. It's broken in some places, but it tends to be much lighter, you know, on, on the uh, upper or the lit side. Yeah. Let me see. I can see that. Yeah. Um, you know, same same thing kind of here. Uh, now he he did kind of really emphasize that hip, but you know that plane was probably in shadow. And then when he gets up here to the part of the leg that's really in light, you know, he almost loses the outline on that. Uh, in along the chest, you know, the arm until he gets, you know, further out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, th I think he's, you know, very, you know, he's being very intentional about where he places uh, lines, you know, to emphasize things. Okay. But uh, again, you know, his, it's like- I like he, that. That yeah, is it's like, pretty. It's like when he puts that line down, um, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a quick gestural stroke. Now in this one, he seems to have buried, you know, most of the heavier lines. You can mm -hmm. see where he had a darker line underneath her. And then he went back and worked over it with, uh, you know, a, a lighter value. Um, yeah, Is this see, watercolor? No, it's oil. It's oil, but it... Yeah. But see, there's no outline on the top in the lid area. And then under here, see, you know, again, he comes back in with a line and, and emphasizes anywhere where there's really compression or weight. Okay. I see. Let's go uh, look at some of his landscapes. Well, okay. And these are the, like the really loose gestural ones. Are these the ones that you really like, Naomi? I like this, but I I like all the loose. I like this. Mm -hmm. I I just think he's great. Is he a? How does he do? Is he a well known? How does he do? I'm sorry. What? How successful is he? Uh, I really don't have any uh, great idea. See now, I mean, this doesn't do it for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, he's a contemporary modern painter. Yeah. So, you know, he's probably got some representation, you know, from a gallery or, you know, things like that. He probably sells work. Now, um, this I don't like. the out. It's too much outlining. Okay. What do you think? Um, I actually like this one, you know, particularly yeah. the emphasis on the hip and the weight there. And then that gestural stroke all the way down the leg and then the calf. Um, and the fact that he changed the color to be warmer, so that really pulled this in front of the shoulder and the torso, which he used mm -hmm. an outline, but he used a, a very neutral uh, outline for it. So it sets it set back. So, you know, he's playing, 
you know, he's playing with color. Um, I like and, that. And changing, you know, changing the temperature and the weight of the line, you know, to, to get it to move forward or backward, you know, so, I mean, he definitely understands, you know, the, the basic principles of contrast. Yeah, now actually I like this one quite a bit. Very interesting. I mean, you know, it's, it's very much so like a gesture drawing and, uh, you know, just the brush strokes. And again, you know, playing with the temperature, you know, this being a much warmer, you know, and the, the violet being cooler and the gray being, you know, kind of neutral. So it, it really kind of moves your eye, you know, to certain areas in the painting. You know, it kind of move, moves your eye through them. Mm -hmm. What style would you say he paints in? Would this be abstract impressionism or something? Or what? No, it's, it's not abstract because, I mean, he's painting, you know, representationally. Um, you know, you know it's a figure, you know it's a landscape. Um, you know, like I said, it's very painterly and gestural is how I would describe it. You know, mm -hmm. is there a particular style to this? No, not really. Um, Bob? Yes? Uh, here in the Google say he's a Russian master impressionist. Master impressionist? Mm -hmm. okay. All right. I wouldn't really call this impressionism, but okay. You know? I like that. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's got some really nice pieces. Um, What size are these paintings? Are they large or are they small or what? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking they're not too big, really. You know, I'm probably about middle, you know, like maybe 30 by 40, kind of, you know, on that scale or smaller. Like this, looking at it, this I would say that's, that's like probably this. not much over an 18 by 24, just looking at the size of the brush strokes. This is one of the ones I think looks like childlike. You, you mm -hmm. know how, how a child would envision something. Yeah. Now, you know, in, in this particular case, looking at that, I would say, yeah, this is kind of an impressionistic painting. You know, a lot of his figures, not so much. But, you know, again, I mean, I think you can call it anything you want to at this point. Yeah. It's a combination of everything. Yeah. This is also what I call childlike. It's almost like a poster-like uh, painting. Mm -hmm. You know, but the, again, you know, the way he manages color right. and line and, and, you know, the elements that he uses in his paintings, you know, I think he, he does very well with. Yes. <clears throat> he definitely has a, you know, a pretty wide uh, palette range, yeah. you know. So, I mean, you know, a lot of his paintings are very soft and very muted, but then, you know, we've seen examples where, you know, the color is really pretty intense, yeah. you know, all the way through the, the painting. So, mm -hmm. so he changes it up quite a bit, which I like, you know. Now this one uh, appeared to be like an earlier, like an earlier version because let's see, it went forward just a little bit and we saw it again, but we saw it in a, what I would consider a much more finished. Uh, where did that go? Here, the color go. of the walkway was almost like walking on water. I noticed in the other, other piece. Yeah, yeah okay. Opposite yeah, so here's, yeah. Here's the earlier version. And then, you know, you go and see, he's got a lot more paint on it. And uh, it, it just looks a lot more finished, you know, but the depth of the paint and everything else is, is mm -hmm. you know, considerably thicker and deeper. And, but, you know, really, really nice piece. I like this piece a lot, actually. It's a, a nice composition to it. You can see the distant mountains or hills. You can mm -hmm. tell they're a long way away. Yeah. Yeah, and how he uses this kind of one point perspective, you know, this road, you know, that he's pulling you into the composition. Mm -hmm. You know, and then these big strong shapes of these trees, 
you know, to take up sort of the center, you know, of the painting and kind of give it weight and anchor it. Yeah. Nice stuff. Say what? Two, where the houses were. Uh huh. I think it's two frames ago. I simplified not only the background is, but the foreground. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's really right on the verge of just being abstract. You know, I mean, he puts things in there, but they they are they're reduced. You know, to really simplified <laughs> elements. Anyhow, well, good. See, we had something to talk about, right? Yep. All right. Well, let's look at Mr. Signac. Okay, he'll be the last artist that we look at today. <clears throat> Oh, wait a minute now. We already looked at him. Or didn't we? Oh, no. we. No, we didn't see him, oh. didn't see him yet. Okay. All right. Okay, Vladimir. Let's get going. Giddy up. This thing's doing some weird buffering things. Another Russian. Yeah, another Russian. Those darn Russians. No, no, some of them are good. We can't paint them all. Actually, I like the Russians. You know. Well, my parents are uh, white Russian. Mm -hmm. Bet you never knew what a white Russian is. I thought it was a drink, but that's just me. A white Russia was Poland when Russia uh, went in there. Oh, okay. So that was called white Russia. Okay. Okay, I don't, um, come on, what's going on here? All right. Supposedly. Spain now. Come on. There Russia's a good place to leave. <laughs> seems, seems to be that way these days, yes. I think always. Even the the aristocratic Russians went to France. There was a, a, a Russian restaurant, I forget, in Atlanta, and I wanted to go, and I went there, and guess what the food was? French, because the aristocratic Russians liked French food. Yeah, it makes sense. I think it was uh, Catherine the Great, who was a daughter of the King of France, and she came to Russia and came to rule because her husband died. I think she and, killed him. Uh, and she was she was tough. I think she poisoned him or something. <laughs> she ended up killing a lot of people. Yeah. See, he's more realistic. I like the other artist better.
Did you have many people uh, paint on at Ray's on the river? There were six of us. Wow. It was a hot day. Yeah, but we were in the shade. Oh. What'd you guys think? Think anything? I think in, in some of them, you can almost see the commercial background that seems a little more structured than uh, the, uh, of those, the later works that mm -hmm. were loose there, but some of them just seem very, have a commercial influence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, he, he certainly started off, you know, like, as a graphic designer. Oh, right, right. Yeah. So, so yeah, that, that shows, you know, there's a certain amount of uh, 
you know, design skill and, you know, and finish to his work that um, maybe the previous guy, you know, didn't have. Um, you know, but then again, Naomi kind of pointed it out, you know, he's, he's a lot more representational or a lot more realistic about, you know, rendering the form of the figure. He's not as loose. Oh, so, yeah. Is that so, more realistic? Is that what you call photorealism? Well, not really photorealism, but it's it's definitely, you know, uh, he still has a very painterly style, um, but he's not nearly as painterly and loose as the previous guy. So, I thought his compositions were, were well put. I mean, the, the, the figures seem to always, or the, the feel of the fi figures felt right for the, for the backgrounds and the, the places that he had placed the figures in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're really well done, you know, compositions and composition was good. Yeah. Uh, definitely has a, a, a good grasp of, you know, the different types of contrast, you know, edges, values, temperature, you know, intensity. Um, so yeah, he manages all of those very well. Now here's um here's a good example. If you want to know what the impressionists were rebelling against, you know, uh, you can look at this guy's work and, and sort of tell because he's a very much so a French academic painter, and uh, was very much so part of the academy. Lived up till 1924. See, that looks like a photograph. Okay. Thank you, Blurry.
they put so many angels in these paintings? Well, if you read along, um, it was very much so the French Academy's goal, I guess, to keep the classical art of Rome and Greece alive. They thought that that was the highest period of art. And so, you know, they taught accordingly. So, so they kept going back to those classical themes, including the cherubs. I want to know why there are more paintings of men. Why always the women and not men? I think men are good looking and beautiful and interesting. Well. The men are doing uh, the painting. What, what was that, Eloise? The men are doing the painting. Yeah, we ah, have to pay women. Yes, yeah. there you go. We have to pay women. If we paid men and everybody said, oh, something yeah. wrong there. Well, see, thank you, Naomi. You just opened up a whole can of worms that we can talk about. Well, there are gay, wait a second, there are gay artists. Why didn't they do men? Like well, Michelangelo did. Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and there were many, in fact, I'd say the vast majority of sculptures are, men. Uh, are actually male figures. Yes. Did you know that in these seven okay. areas of America, solar? Um, but we see so many nude women, and I think men's bodies are beautiful mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Well, again, oh. you know, if you go back to classical Rome and Greece, um, <coughs> you probably actually see more male figures than you will female in both sculpture, mosaics, paintings, things like that. Uh, but yeah, then, you, had, you had the athletes and the gods and then for the most right. part those. Yeah. yeah. But then, then you had, what, you know, 400, uh, yeah, about 400 years, fast forward, and you've gone through Baroque and Romanticism and stuff like that. And you've come to the French Academy and you've got mainly, not exclusively, but mainly, you know, male, male painters and sculptors, right? And the Academy is promoting, you know, this classical ideal of, you know, Greece and the gods and the, Ro you know, Roman, uh, you know, all of that Western aesthetic, you know, early Western aesthetic, you know, and, and for, in their viewpoint, the height of civilization was ancient Greece and Rome, okay? Which is kind of sad, really, when you think about it, because, you know, they're saying that was the height, and it went downhill from there. <laughs> and yeah, we made it back in the Renaissance, but, you know, we, we still have not achieved what the ancients did, you know, as far as the pinnacle of art. Um, and so you get to the 1800s, you know, and they're still teaching the same old way. But the society has changed, the aesthetics have changed. And so what they're doing is they're sort of wallpapering over, you know, that classical aesthetic, you know, with the modern day view in society. And, you know, for 1800s, you know, Elizabethan, uh, you know, England and France, you know, what they, you know, what they saw as being beautiful, beautiful was, you know, femininity. And that's why a lot of the French academic painters like Bouguereau, you know, painted almost exclusively women. So, so it's, it's just a changing of the times. And oddly enough, really up until about the 19, probably about the 1960s or 1970s, um, that aesthetic held pretty, pretty true. And then around about the 1960s, you know, you started having artists, um, videographers, uh, photographers, painters, um, you know, begin to do more male figures. 
And so today, you know, it's probably still, you know, uh, you know, more female figures than male. But then again, you know, um, and this is just my own personal experience too. If you go to a lot of the figure drawing groups, probably 90% of the time, you're going to have a female figure. And there's various reasons for that. You know, um, it's notoriously hard to get a male model these days. And that's because, you know, most men have jobs, you know, and don't, aren't trying to make a living as a model. You know, they're, they may be doing it on the side or something. So they're only av available in the evenings or the weekends or something like that. And there are a lot more female figures available. So, so you know, when you go into a figure drawing class, like I said, it's more than likely going to be a female model. These I think, like you said, it's a sign of the times when they wanted to project victory, conquest, uh, mm -hmm. strength, and power. They painted and sculpted men when they wanted to project uh, whenever there were times of relatively peace. They wanted ro more, they had time for more romanticism. So therefore they used women or something softer in uh, nature uh, to paint. So I think it's just a sign of the times. And now we're mixed. So <laughs> some of it's some of it's romanticism and some of it's uh, conquest. Yeah. Well, now these days, you know, you could say fairly safely that no matter of what the figure looks like, you could be painting a man, man or a woman. You don't really know which they are. <laughs> so, you know. Do you think part what, uh, the earlier attention to women in painting had to do with women's uh, emancipation and the suffrage and all that, where women were coming forward out of the kitchens. <laughs> well, yeah, but that didn't really happen until like the 1920s and 1930s. Um, you know, in America now, in France, right, yeah. yeah, probably maybe 1910, maybe a little bit earlier, but not that much. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly it's, it's a, it's partially a social commentary, you know, on, on what society was like at that time. So, you know, what can we say? Uh, let's see. It's 1116. I've got one more thing that I'm going to try to, to show you guys. And, uh, and this is, you better hold on to your seats on this one. Because uh, it's our it's our favorite, you know, guy Valdemir, and uh, he's in Japan. And he's asking an interesting question. So, don't go away. The body's only healthy when your hormones are balanced, and that's why unbalanced hormones can really impact your life from local. You're going to say two words to me. I want you to choose instinctively, immediately, which sounds good and which sounds bad. First word is natural. Second is artificial. Of course, you thought that natural sounds good and artificial sounds bad. You were brought up to think that, and so was I. But there's somewhere where this distinction isn't nearly as clear cut. It's a place where the artificial seems perfectly natural. And in that sense, it's somewhere that got to the future before us. I 
The Orient has always exercised a hold on our Western imaginations. We Westerners have long been attracted to the amazing wonders of the East. That seems to me to be still the case. The modern East is still filled with wonders, but these days they're made out of plastics and polymers rather than silk or lapis lazuli or jade. Silk Route's replacement, the 12-hour non-stop flight from Heathrow to Tokyo, picks you up in one era of human civilization and drops you off in the next. What we have here is a place that's spectacularly ready for the way things are going to be. They're at ease with the synthetic, unafraid of the artificial. Technology is a friend, not a fiend. Now, why is that? The future began early in these parts. While we were inventing Morris dancing, the Japanese were coming up with the first robots. This is the Takayama Festival of Early Robotics, an annual gathering of gnarled and ancient robot lovers who come here every year to prepare for progressiveness by remembering how things used to be. Japan, which has a civilization much older than ours, that's developed on very different lines, invented the low-tech robot about 500 years ago. Carpenters of the past are very famous, uh, still they are uh, famous, for uh, building uh, the houses and temples. The carpenters competed their technology by producing a very, very interesting uh, robots without using any uh, electricity, of course. And, uh, it, it's a competition of a very intricate technology invented, uh, really invented by uh, the skilled carpenters. Come festival time, the ancient robots take to the streets with an excellent ambition to cheer up their makers and bring them delight. These ones paraded annually through the streets of Takayama are mostly from the 1700s. In Japanese cultural terms, they're robotic newcomers. But already, as you can see, they're a playful bunch. Because in the 18th century, early Japanese robots were science having fun. And guess what? It still is. <laughs> Okay, start. He woke up. Like many wide-eyed school kids, Dr. Doi enjoyed playing with robots as a youngster. He read comics, he thrilled at the adventures of Astro Boy. And when he grew up and got to run a large chunk of Sony, he remembered this early enthusiasm for robots and decided to share it with us. What we require from deepest in our soul are love, or healing, or peace, relax, such a kind of things. So what I, I am doing is to answer the very, very deep desire of our soul. Kiko. I thought I was playing with a little mechanical doggy. But Dr. Doy tells me that Ibo 2 is actually a baby lion. What looks to me like doggy behavior is just a miniature robot lion's way 
of coming down to our level in order to entertain us. Can you give us some idea of what kinds of robots you foresee? In the Where are they going to play a role in our life? Uh, first of all, the, even this the very simple device of the dog type robot, original Ibo, uh, we have been receiving a lot of letters from the owners. And some of them are older people who lost their partner and now living with the, this uh, robot. Now I have the feeling that this simple device can heal people, which sounds very strange because this is not an animal, this is not living in real man, but this can heal people, which is a rather a surprise for us. How to escape the... This only takes five minutes. Tired of hot and stuffy rooms during summer? When you get old, lonely, unmortgaged, you'll find a shortage of young people prepared to look after you and talk to you. It's an international problem. In Britain, we slip our old people a couple of fivers and let them rot to their lonely deaths behind closed council doors. In Japan, where the diet is so outrageously low in fats and carcinogens that you live, on average, into your late 80s, they've developed special friendly old people robots to be there for you and keep you company. When you come to the temple and prepare spiritually to meet your maker, there's always someone there to greet you, to say welcome. In Japan, you can't get the staff these days any more than you can in Britain. But who needs staff when you've got one of these? The modern Japanese robot can do much more than hoover your home. It can entertain you, comfort you, and even bring you spiritual sustenance. This is the famous robot monk of Hotoku. Its builder, Mr. Matsuka, has ensured that no lonely pilgrim can ever enter Hotoku Temple without a rousing Buddhist welcome. My main reason for creating this robot was to do something in memory of my mother. My mother only came here twice, but she believed in Buddhism very deeply, and that's why I created this monk for the temple. Can you tell us how the robot is made? What are the pieces you've used to create it? The moving arm is made out of an old motor from the windscreen wiper of the car. The clothes are from the robes of a student monk. I'd like to reduce the amount of rubbish in the world and create a better environment. Even the tape recorder is a recycled one. <laughs> Reverend, in Britain it would be really unusual to find a robot in a church. Is it something that's somehow more likely in Japan? According to Buddhism, everything you can see is artificial. It's only the surface. You can't see the truth. You can't see the mind of the Buddha. Therefore, everything is transient. Nothing will last forever. So, Buddhists welcome new eras and new material. If 
you wind back the clock of a typical Japanese life, back from the robotic comforts of old age to the happy enthusiasms of youth, you arrive at a childhood with very different priorities from one of ours. This is a little open day in a little school near Nagoya. As with all open days everywhere, the parents muck in and the kids chase about. But whereas at one of our schools, most of the intergenerational energy goes into baking fudge and collecting prizes for the tombola, in this little school near Nagoya, they've got the kids battling to build the best robot. And instead of a lecture from the local councillor on the importance of the 11 plus, they've invited a special visitor to enthuse the kids about their future. So what's your name then? Maria. It's a beautiful name. I do like this robot. With her interesting 17th century fashion sense, she certainly stands out from the crowd. But virtual technology in Japan has moved far ahead of this. It's moved to the stage where the divide between the natural and the artificial has almost disappeared. This isn't my perfect woman. She hasn't got any legs and she's a little small for me. But I do know a man who can make the perfect woman for me. How to store and sort all your photos. No computer knowledge required. Chances are, you probably have countless pictures and You get geeks in every country, but only in Japan do you get the otaku, the Japanese hermit geek, a being so in tune with the electronic pulses of cyberspace that they've co-joined mystically with their own computers. Well, let's get down to our business here then. Yeah. Create our, uh, our perfect woman. So the first stage, as I gather, is, is, is to create the body. Is that right? Yeah. Well, okay. Is there a choice that I can make? Oh. Thin and fat, tall, short. Well, I'm just just quite medium to begin with. And uh, maybe we can make some adjustments after that sort of medium body, really. Nice, you know, I mean, for me, a little bit wider hips, maybe. Uh, is it possible to see her from the side? It's good, it's nice, nice, nice profile. Oh, she's spinning around. Quite thin. So that's her final body. So should we do the, the head now? Yeah. A nice classic profile. That's a very Japanese nose. A little bit longer. <laughs> that's a bit too long, isn't it? Shorter, shorter. <laughs> so can we do the final face and then put the body together? You can do any hairstyle you want, cut it short, long. Can we try her blonde, see what that looks like? Yeah. Okay. You can even see the roots. Oh, you've done the roots, that's clever. Um, uh, maybe we go back, I think maybe the brunette looks slightly more natural. Sijuro-san, would you call yourself an otaku? Mm, having sausage. Maybe. So tell us what that means. What, what is an otaku in your terms? As the word suggests, it's someone who stays at home all the time and doesn't go out and just sits at the computer all day long. Occasionally, I go out for meetings, but I spend most of my time in this office and I don't play any sports. Is that exactly, we finished now, is this, is this her? 
was fantastic. The bikini? She's classically beautiful. It's wonderful. What sort of relationship do you have with your creations? Do you fall in love with every woman you create? <laughs> I don't fall in love with the girls. My feeling is that they are my daughters. I've got my Eve. She doesn't look anything like I expected her to. But creating humans from scratch is a tricky business, as God found out when he had the first ever go at creating paradise. It's autumn. The nights are closing in. The leaves have turned brown. Winter is in the air. This ought to mean that lounging around on the beach and riding ten-footers into the sunset was entirely out of the question. But at the Miyazaki surfer's paradise, every day of the year is a sizzling summer's day in Hawaii. It took God a week to create Eden. Japanese builders spent three years coming up with this place. The beach was imported from China and is made of granulated marble. The waves are created by a giant mechanized ripple machine that sends reliable 10-footers crashing onto the shore every 10 seconds. If you come from a famously hard-working society that takes very short holidays, that has neither the time nor the temperament to take risks with the weather, then why bother traveling thousands of miles at huge expense to get to something that can be created in handy miniature on your own doorstep? I know people who'd be so snooty about this place. Maybe you too are unimpressed. You might be thinking, this isn't as good as the real Hawaii. It's tacky, it's virtual, it'll never catch on. Just remember, people said the same thing about the virtual 15-piece rhythm section, complete with backing vocalists. And look what happened to that. nervous, I admit it. I'm going to meet one of the most influential Japanese who's ever lived. A man who's changed the world, and yes, made it a better place. He hasn't taught the world to sing, we could already do that, but we weren't doing enough of it. This man realized that inside every tuneless middle-aged has-been, there's a lead singer dying to get out. So he invented karaoke. And there it is, for the first time on British television, the machine that changed the world. Today's karaoke machines are very complex, state-of-the-art affairs. It's when was the first moment that the world heard modern karaoke. It was about 30 years ago. Uh, There's a place in Tokyo called Nihonbashi. And a friend of mine went to Nihonbashi and bought all the components. He cut them out with a saw and painted them. It's all handmade. <laughs> Wherever you go these days, there's a karaoke bar somewhere in the area. Why do you think it's had such an international impact? 
あのみんな歌いたいんですよ。歌いたいんだけども、Everyone really want to sing. だから、They are too shy. However, if someone else starts singing, then they'll start singing too. そういうバカにされたとか、そういうことはないですね。And once they get hold of the microphone, you can never get it back. <laughs> Karaoke means empty orchestra. This isn't a toy, a mere diversion. It's a virtual exploration of another world. I'm not Frank Sinatra. This isn't the Albert Hall. But just for a moment, I don't know that. I took the blows. Why is it that in the presence of this much wondrous nocturnal technology? Whose sole purpose, and what a sensible one it is, is to make me happy, I find myself feeling, well, guilty instead. I'm suffering from a residual medieval misery, which the Japanese simply don't seem to have. Thank you very much. In Britain, amusement arcades are places I keep out of. Life's too short to spend any of it. In the company of maladjusted, flick knife wielding teenagers who've come here to shoot and maim their way to victory. In Britain, amusement arcades are sad places in which sad people come specially to avoid other sad people. But look at this place. <laughs> Lovers out for the day, families on an outing, smiles, guffaws. This is fun. I've seen the future of amusement arcades, and it's okay. It's healthy, it's bright. In Britain, I'm sure everyone enjoys playgrounds too, but here they become more family oriented. And of course, we've changed them by electrifying them. Social revolution is surging through Japan. The young, and particularly young women, are rebelling against the old ways. They seek a louder voice, a bigger say in their own lives. But isn't it interesting how, in challenging tradition, the teenage rebel blondes of the new Japan look just as different from their natural selves as their samurai pleasing geisha predecessors? The first time I came to Japan, you'd see women walking a few feet behind men as a mark of deference. Today, you still see women walking behind men, not as a mark of deference, but because they can't walk any faster on the outrageously tall platform footwear that is all the rage here. <laughs> Ninety percent of what you see in a rebellious Ganguro girl comes from a bottle. They are their own greatest creations. The unlikely new blondes. Do what they do to shock their mums and get noticed in the streets. But they do it with an exquisite artificial precision that is unmistakably and traditionally Japanese. Mm. 
Some girls have got suntans, and they wear interesting makeup, but they just want to enjoy themselves and be happier. Some people say it's just a passing fad, but I think it's more than that. Do you think that Japanese people have a different relationship to artificial things than Western people? Because the, the Kogaru look is very artificial, it's an artificial beauty. A lot of Japanese have childlike looks, and even when they are 25 or 30, they look like young girls, very childlike. So they wear unusual makeup to make themselves look more adult. And the glue that binds their rebellion together isn't a glue at all. It's a purse-sized electronic wonder upon which they are totally reliant. Stream 55 plus live channel. Even if they don't actually use them for having conversations, by having a mobile phone, they're showing that they have a friend who will communicate with them and that they can communicate with. It gives them a feeling of security. It's almost a defense against the loneliness, a healing product. もしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもしもし
Westminster Abbey hadn't been built, 1066 hadn't happened, thousand years ago. The white parts are the center of the tree, and they are dead. These parts have hardened like fossils. That's the rest of the tree will live for another few hundred years. What is the overall concept of bonsai? What is the idea behind the art form? A small tree will evoke nature in a very concentrated way. It's not just a pretty tree. If you look after the tree, it will evoke the atmosphere of somewhere else. So you can feel the wind or the clouds, another kind of nature. That is what bonsai should be. Different trees come from different areas. Some originally grew near the sea, or near the rivers, or near the mountains. So trees from different natural environments naturally create different atmospheres. So really a bonsai is a, a prompt, if you like, for the imagination. It takes you away from where you are, towards this distant nature that you remember. When people see a very old bonsai tree, it makes them feel as if they've made a little trip to a place they could never actually visit. The bonsai encourages this kind of response in those who grow them or watch them. So, bonsai isn't just about smallness, it's about creating a virtual reality. And that really is a traditional Japanese speciality. Why should the world take up more space than it needs to? Oh no! Oh. Watching a movie here on these new Olympus special glasses. Imagine you're going home from work on the train, you put these on, you can watch a film, you can watch a video of some kind, and no one will ever know what you're watching. Amazing. The same company is apparently working on like a special pair of clear glasses that have cameras in them and earphones that record every conversation you ever have. So for example, if you walk into a party and you meet somebody and you can't remember their name, but you've met them before, the information will be recorded in your glasses and the glasses, which are called the whispering glasses, will whisper to you the name of the person you can't remember. Now that is very clever. <laughs> Because of our constitutional constraints, we are not permitted to have any military uh, industry. Even the uh, military it's, uh, itself is uh, disarmed under constitution. I think that is a lie. But anyhow, uh, our, our technology should be mobilized for consumer goods production only, not for military. There you have it. In Britain, our super brainy technical types have been busily inventing useful new weapons of mass destruction. In Japan, they've come up with this. Mario is the most successful character in children's entertainment ever. He's more successful than Mickey Mouse and Popeye than any of them. Can you tell us what kind of origins he has? How did you come upon this character? I was brought up in the countryside, surrounded by nature. Everyone should have a chance to experience some kind of nature. I think it's nice if you can experience at home what isn't possible in real life. So I created a virtual world 
filled with my own experiences, and people can enjoy in the game what's impossible in real life. I think it's important to experience joy physically from head to toe. Is it true that when Mario discovers these fabulous little hidden kingdoms, these secret corners of the world that he runs around in so energetically, that what we're trying to recreate or perhaps touch again is some of the feeling that you had as a child of exploring the, a world that was fresh and new to you? I always wanted to make what we call Hakoniwa a miniature garden in a box. And I wanted to play games in that Hakoniwa. In the case of Super Mario, basically, I created a special Hakoniwa, my own miniature world. And all my physical experiences can go into it. Mario has an unlikely daytime profession for a superhero. He's a plumber. But the makeup of the Japanese house is changing so rapidly that even Mario's fabulous plumbing know-how would prove pretty useless in here. What, for instance, would our mustachioed super plumber make of one of these? You know how you go into the toilet to find some peace, solve the crossword, read some Rushdie? Well, the bad news about the Japanese house of the future is that all this will constitute a waste of time. Time that could be spent much more efficiently having a major medical checkup. So that's height 84. Whenever your seat touches the seat, one of these will immediately examine your stools and check that your kidneys are working properly. If you're drinking too much, the information will be relayed to your doctor, who won't tell you to cut down the booze. That's the old way of doing things. Oh no, this doctor will immediately contact your fridge and tell it what not to stock. The fridge phones the supermarket and orders up what the doctor recommends. This gets delivered to your home and then cooked to the doctor's recipe by the computer-operated super microwave. Another thing the smart toilet does is weigh you every time you sit down. Then it instantly measures changes in your body fat with these special fat-probing pads. The toilet then tells you to go on a diet. And the fridge contacts the supermarket and orders a month's supply of low-calorie fish flakes. There are hundreds of ways of cooking fish flakes and your computerized super microwave will know all of them. Lovely. Mitsubishi is a very well-known company, very well-known in Britain, very well-known in the world for all kinds of industries. But it's a surprise to us to find out that you are now also making robot fish. It came out of our research into a new kind of propulsion system for submarines. Because even today, it's quite difficult to keep an underwater vehicle stable when it's not moving.
この I wondered what's the best way was for people to understand this system. 理解、ご理解していただくというためにですね。And so to show it more clearly, I had the idea of robot fish. 表現するために、一つの魚ロボットということで、I chose the sea b r e e because it's a fish that's very well known to Japanese people. Then we made a sea a c o u n t 種類の魚、タイを取り上げて、皆様にご覧いただいて、そのリアリティの高さを評価していただこうと考えました。実は私どもはその実際に見ることのできない魚を作ることによって、We are planning to build an aquarium that contains various extinct fish. できるのではないかと考えて、Fish you can't see anymore. ご提案いたしております。その中には、And I also hope we can create some creatures from the Cambrian period の生物などがですね、実際に実現できたらいいなと考えております。One day there'll be virtual aquariums filled with these. No fish need ever be extinct or lonely again. My brain knows this isn't a real Celia Canth, but my senses are hesitating. The robot fish feels spookily convincing. It swims, it leaps, it teaches submarines how to dive. The one thing you can't do with it is eat it. <laughs> The curious Japanese believe that artificial things can have a life. There's another side to it, the yang to its yin, which is that live things can also achieve an artificial beauty. Tesco's have recently reported that they sell more sushi than cheese sandwiches in their stores these days. What a turn up for the books that is. The British preferring raw fish to sad slices of cheddar. But it had to happen. It makes so much sense. This is food that brings a new set of culinary ideals to the table. It's designed to be compact, practical, color coded. It does away with the need for knives, forks, tureens, all the cumbersome accoutrement of traditional British eating. With this, you save space and live to be 90. This is food that proves that to be full of natural goodness, you don't have to look natural at all. From here to the three course sachet filled with powdered goodness. Is a small step. Pot noodles, done well, are a great Japanese invention too. Stream 85 plus live channel. Right now I'm here out in Colorado at the GoPro Mountain Games. GoPro was so kind to put us up on a hot air balloon. Everything is somebody's handiwork. And if our world is God's handiwork, then why shouldn't the bits of it that we make do exactly what we need them to? Japanese have recently taken up football. They're not much good at it yet, but they will be. A robot's already helping them practice penalties for the next World Cup. By the year 
the prediction here is that teams of robots will be taking on teams of humans in the Robo World Cup. Now, you wouldn't want to bet against skilled teams of Japanese robots winning that, would you? He's at a very early stage still, but when you finished your research with mm -hmm. Pino, uh, what will this robot do? What kind of uh, activities will it? Ah, oh, okay, okay. This is uh, now we have the sums of about the similar project. One of this uh, Robocup project, and we have been studying the Robocup humanoid leagues, uh, I mean, the football league. Uh, this is for the uh, research about b uh, research robot, especially for the Robocup. And uh, next year, we're having the Robocup football exhibition. So, the Robocup, which is this tournament, uh, okay. football tournament yeah. for robots. Yeah. Are you, in, in next year, he's yeah. going to play football in yes. the World Cup, yeah. is he? Yes. Oh. Is he good? Is he going to be a good footballer? I hope so, yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I read that by the year 2050, yes. teams of robots, yeah, it's 11, 11 robots will be playing yeah. teams of humans. Yeah. Is that likely? Yes. Yeah, yeah, 2050, right? Yeah. Yeah. What is our problem with the artificial? Our own landscape is almost entirely man-made. God didn't invent fields and hedges and country lanes, or thatched cottages, water features, and the perfect lawn. We did all that. Yet foolishly, foolishly, we've convinced ourselves that there's something natural about Surrey and something unnatural about the Miyazaki surfer's paradise, when one is merely a bigger, colder version of the other. If you welcome the artificial as enthusiastically as the Japanese have done, then you welcome some wacky things. Girls with ruined postures and nuclear hairdos wobble uncomfortably down your street. Sad otaku types who never leave the room they smoke in fiddle endlessly with their computers. People with no voices imagine they can sing. All this is perhaps regrettable. But you also get old people who aren't allowed to be lonely, visiting temples that aren't allowed to stay silent. Lovers out for a day's shared button pushing. Gadgets that do things you didn't even know were useful till you did them. Adventure, fun, bright lights. There's nothing terrible about any of this. The only thing we should fear is our own irrational fear of new things. Britain and Japan have an edgy relationship. Each has some reason to be suspicious of the other. But I've been here a lot of times now, and I've come to realize that they're unexpectedly similar places. Tenacious island kingdoms floating off the mainland, used to doing things their way. Inventive, cussed, and a touch mad. The biggest difference between us is in our attitude to the future. In Britain, we're wary of it. In Japan, they welcome it. In fact, they're enjoying it already. I've got so. Anybody there? <laughs> that was mind-boggling. Mind-boggling, yes. That's a that's a good uh, that's a good description of it, actually, isn't it? So, yeah, that was kind of all over the place. Um, but it's it's kind of you know the question was you know about artificial art, you know, and. If you look around Japan in particular, you know, with technology, everything else, uh, and, you know, computers, um, you know, they're creating art in a lot of different ways, you know, but for them, it's, it's not really a new thing, you know, it, it actually goes back, you know, to, you know, their ancient culture uh, about, you know, them 
kind of accepting new new technologies and kind of the always looking forward for the next thing, you know, the next step forward. Unlike, you know, a lot of Westerners, we, we fear technology. We don't want to take that next step, you know? So it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting contrast, I suppose. So, yeah. We scared a bunch of people away though. We're, we're down to just really, you know, three of us. So, Jean is, I think maybe hanging in there. She's not, maybe she went and got her uh, exam or whatever she had to go do. Um, Bob, what do you think? Uh, it was interesting. Um, you know, the, the fact that, uh, that the cultures influence the product, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that, that uh, you know, do, do, do Westerners fear change? Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure I believe all that. Uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, but I mean, I, I, I'm, I've got some interesting family members that uh, would, would just certainly challenge that, uh, that thesis. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, you know, yeah, I kind of wonder about that too, because I, I think actually, well, I don't know about Westerners, but certainly America, you know, or the United States to be exact. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of innovative innovation and in technology yep. here, you know, um, I think he made a good point, which is, you know, our brightest minds are working on, on things that are not necessarily beneficial to all people. Unfortunately, a lot of them end up in the defense industry and, you know, it's kind of scary, but, uh, but you know, certainly I, I think in the United States, yeah, we're kind of known for being innovative, you know, in technologies. Yep. You know. I think it depends on the generations too. The newer, the young generation now is more adventuresome to me. They try new things, they're interested in the future now. The old generation, some of us are stuck. Mm -hmm. Some are fear new things. Yeah. And forever are we comparing the old, the trying to remember what it was uh, 50 years ago or whatever. The new the challenge, the new versus the old, and mm -hmm. we're stuck in the middle. So I don't know. It depends. If you're young at heart, then you're welcome change. I think. If you're not, then you dread it. Yeah. Well, I've certainly you know, run into that. Well, we ran into that at the very beginning of the pandemic, remember? When mm -hmm. we started, you know, people getting onto Zoom and some people adapted to it and actually enjoy it and like it. And other people, you know, just don't like it, <laughs> you know, or at least, you know, actually in conversations that I've had with a lot of the students that I had pre-pandemic, you know, a lot of them would be interested in art classes, but they have this thing about virtual learning. They just, you know, they don't get it, you know? And the fact is they don't want to get it. Right. And that's, that's really more it, you know? It's like, you know, they don't want to have to adapt and change to anything other than what they're used to, so, yeah. Well, see, I'm very, I'm very advanced because I just bought a refrigerator that makes my coffee for me. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. See? Yeah. I mean, and it simplifies your life. You know, it, it, it gives you ice cubes and makes you coffee. And maybe is it smart enough to put the two together and make you a nice coffee? It could do that. It could do that. <laughs> there you go. See, it, you know, it makes it a perfect world. There you go. <laughs> Hot coffee, cool coffee, you know, I mean. <laughs> you know, got you covered. <laughs> I consider myself sort of progressive, but I'm not sure I agree with that toilet seat method of uh, oh. analyzing your innards and then t having your refrigerator for, I mean, having your uh, doctor send information to your refrigerator. Your refrigerator adapts his diet and I can't <laughs> eat chocolate like I want to, in fact. Right. <laughs> 
I don't know whether I'd go along with that too much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, that, that definitely goes against the grain of Western philosophies because, I mean, you know, we, we particularly again in the United States, you know, we, you know, the whole country is brought up with this ideal of, you know, rugged individualism, you know, which frankly came from a, a whole totally different century and in some ways holds us back. And in Asia, you know, these, these concerns of privacy don't really exist, you know, because they're raised in a multi-generational household, you know, where great-grandparents, grandparents, parents, children, you know, are all, you know, brought up together. And there is no such thing as privacy, <laughs> you know? When you've got, you know, when you've got like, you know, 10, 10 or 12 people in a very small house, you know, it just doesn't exist. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a real different, it's a real different uh, viewpoint, I guess. So, you know, who knows? You know, <clears throat> I can't, I can't see myself living in, in the house that I bought you know, with uh, a lot of people here. You know, I bought this house so that I wouldn't have a lot of people here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to kind of, you know, get a little space around me. <laughs> so, so that, you know, this place accomplishes that for me. So. Solitude is wonderful. <laughs> yes, it is, you know. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm pr pretty much so over the days of wanting to be around a lot of people. You know, I really am. So I guess, I guess you could safely say that's, I'm getting to be a grumpy old man. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, I, yeah. I was going to say adios. I, okay. All right. Well, now we won't have class tomorrow. I'm going to send out an email announcing that. Good. Um, but we will be back here Friday. Well, we won't be here. I'll be in Atlanta. Uh, we'll have the drawing class Friday morning. And we will not have a model, okay, on Friday. Um, but probably the following week we will, okay? And okay. We're, we're going to continue to talk about, you know, this thing called perspective. And... Uh, as it applies to all things, including human bodies. Okay. Charles, I originally objected to to, to learning about uh, taking a drawing class and figures and all of that stuff, but I'm, I think it's helped me to improve a little bit and I like it a little bit more now than I used to. So thanks for the exposure. Yeah, it's growing on you, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. Yeah, it's a hard it's a hard pill to swallow sometimes, you know. <laughs> you know, oh, I gotta learn this. Uh. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it's like everything else in art, you know. It's all connected. Mm -hmm. You know, one one thing informs another. So I can see that. Yeah. Thank you so much, and have a great afternoon. You too. All right. Bye, bye, all. Bye.